Welcome to the January 7, 2009 edition of the Open Forum. Once again, we have the real pleasure and privilege, and oh my, what a privilege it is to look together into the Word of God to discover truth. And you know, when we do this, we should be un... Uh, un, uh, not hesitate at all to look at any passage, any verse in the Bible that we think might relate to whatever subject we're interested in uh, to see once if uh, we have c truly understood, clearly, accurately understood a particular doctrine. We must be ready to face anything and everything uh, because we never want to impose our idea on the Bible. We want to let the Bible come to us. We must approach the Bible. I don't know anything, Lord, out of my mind. Uh, I think the Bible says thus and so, or I've discovered it says thus and so. And the more we look at each and every verse that might relate, we are, are become more and more convinced we have the truth. And yet, we should never hesitate to look at another verse uh, because uh, uh, we want to make sure, uh, yeah, checking and double-checking and triple-checking, that we have the truth in whatever we're teaching. But now we are ready to take our first call tonight. Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Campion, good night. A very blessed New Year to you and your family. Thank you. Um, and I hope that with this new year, many of our callers would be mindful of the 30-day um, timeline and, and not to call um, before that time is up. Um, I have an observation uh, and, and two questions. Hello? Yes. What is your question? Uh, I'm going to give you my observation first, and then I'm going to go to my two questions. Um, did you ever look at the um, spiritual um, significance of the the first time that um, um, Israel became a nation in 1407 B.C. And, and the next time when they became a nation uh, in their own right in 1948 A.D. That that's um, um, three three five four years, which breaks down into two times three times four to three times thirteen. Nineteen. Uh... Uh, no, wait. They became a nation... In 1407 four B.C. when they got into the land of Canaan? Uh, yeah. Uh, and 1948 A.D.? Yes. Well, there are other numbers that do fit in very nicely together uh, because we have... God has led us to a, a, a very accurate accounting uh, understanding of the unfolding of Scripture and that's uh, that is very well possible uh, there every now and then i get a letter from somebody or like you were calling and they say we have discovered this or discovered that and that's uh, that's uh, very that's that's not surprising at all because everything there are so many things tie together but now what is your question okay can we look at john 434 John 4:34. Well, John 4. I think I'm going the wrong direction. John 4:34. We read, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me, and to finish His work. Now, what is your question? Now, um, if, the, if, if the work of salvation was already finished in eternity past, what work was God refer, uh, Christ referring to in this oh. verse? Oh. What work did he have to do? Well, first of all, for example, the work of salvation, while the work that Jesus had to do in making payment for our sin was completed, but he still has to give us a brand new resurrected body. That's also part of the salvation plan. He has to give those who are elect of God a, a new resurrected soul, if they haven't already been given that. And he also has to complete the whole justice program of God. 
uh, the uh, Christ has a lot of work to do yet. That uh, and 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 this is what he is coming to. Uh, this is what he's been working on uh, 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 throughout the thirteen thousand years of history, and will continue to work until the uh, this earth is no more. It's all gone. Okay, um, and how about let's look at uh, Matthew twenty-seven. 51 to 52. Matthew 27, 51 and 52. We read, And behold, the veil of the temple was rented too from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks wrenched, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now, what is your question? Uh, now, now, you've been teaching that um, the saints who um, came out to the graves at this time when, the, um, uh, you know, when Christ was at the cross, demonstrating um, the atonement, that they had to wait uh, until the Sunday morning um, when Jesus resurrected before yeah, yes, they could yeah. go into the holy city. You but if he finished the work um, in eternity past, they were, they're paying for their sins. Why couldn't they go into the holy city just like Moses and, and, and Enoch and Elijah? They were already in the holy city, you know. Well, that's God's plan, first of all, to demonstrate that Christ arose from the grave. And uh, he wanted that demonstration to, demonstration to go that far showing that he Christ is the first fruits and now these are, are, arise and God may have had other reasons but that would be a big reason and uh, so uh, they arose after Christ rose it's underscoring a principle that Christ is the first fruits oh. but thank you for calling so what, no, no 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 hello hello I, just, I have another question hello yes yeah, um, in in the book um, "To God Be the Glory," yeah, in many places you, um, you, you kept referring to the fact that um, that Christ was um, putting on a demonstration for the principalities and powers. Yeah, but if 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 God was not was not um, you know sitting on His hands in eternity past, it means that these principalities and powers would have been around when Christ was. Um, first uh, making the payment so they would have oh excuse me the fact is that uh, the it isn't just a demonstration of the fact that Christ paid for our sins it's a demonstration of all the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ what a glorious Savior he is all of his attributes and uh, you know uh, it's uh, Christ <laughs> had to put up with this sin-cursed world for 13,000 years. Uh, he, uh, show, he demonstrates his patience, his mercy, his forgiveness, his, uh, how he deals with Satan. He demonstrates all kinds of qualities that could only be demonstrated by, uh, uh, by the... the uh, the uh, uh, the events that happened upon this earth. Also, uh, he came uh, to show the uh, uh, the heavens declared the glory of God. Uh, what a wonderful creator he is! As as he uh, uh, created all the different animals and man and 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 uh, fish and so on. Uh, oh, that that. The, the, what, he, what he had done before the foundation of the world, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, one thing that he did, but it's to show all the glories of God and how that impacts upon those that he did save. And so it's, it's a, an infinitely bigger picture than just what he did before the foundation of the world. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. Yes, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good. I, I've been listening to you for a while, and I just want to clarify the difference between um, uh, a gift and a work, because uh, as far as I understand, uh, salvation is a gift and not uh, any works that we do. 
and that we're given a measure of faith, and that faith uh, cometh by hearing the word of God. But if if we are to be saved and the elect are to be elect, then what is the purpose of Jesus if it's black and white? Well, now, excuse me. Uh, 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 works have anything to do with what we do. The work, that, or it has to do with what Christ did. Now, there's an enormous distinction between the work that Christ did in making payment for our sins, and that was an enormous piece of work, as he faithfully, and he is the very essence of faith, because faith also is a work. Uh, he did all of that on our behalf, and we, we made absolutely no contribution of any kind. Uh, but now, once we are saved, works will show up in our life as a result of the fact that we become saved, like faith should be uh, clearly seen in our life, that we believe all that what the Bible is teaching and hang our whole life on what the Bible teaches. Uh, and uh, uh, Or uh, love is a work. And uh, uh, anything that we do that is obedience uh, to the Word of God, that is work. And uh, the... Uh, the gift of salvation that we had nothing to do to attain that nothing at all to do it is strictly a gift of God because he did all the work to accomplish it and so there really isn't any any uh, uh, mixture there at all but thank you for calling and sh now uh, uh, when we're given faith it is as we're reading Romans 10 Verse 17, where, where that faith comes not to produce or help us get saved, that is a result of the fact that we have become saved. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Mr. Camping. A very simple question. If God knows before... He creates me, that I'm going to sin, and that I'm not going to be part of the elect. Then why on earth would he create me in the first place? Because we're all, you see, we have to remember, the purpose of the, uh, of the uh, duration of planet Earth over the last 13,000 plus years was not for our sake it was for Christ's sake it was to demonstrate His glory His glory now in the process uh, mankind didn't have it too bad well uh, they were created in the image of God and had the potential to have a wonderful future of eternity uh, internal, eternal inheritors of the kingdom of God and, uh, and have eternal life and so they lost all of that uh, but nevertheless if they uh, in, lived at le all decently before God uh, in, in this world they, uh, life has been very enjoyable why is it that people don't want to think about death uh, I used to think it's because they fear the judgment. Yes, there may be a little of that, maybe, but mainly they're enjoying life. They have their family and they have their friends and, and they have their good times and life is very enjoyable. And so, even though they, and, and when they die, uh, most people when they die, and I can say this, I believe, very f uh, definitely, most people, when they die, have no idea that they have endured any kind of a uh, wrath of God because of the way they lived. They've enjoyed life, even in their death. It's been a peaceful death, and uh, uh, they have no knowledge of what they have given up, the eternity of uh, in eternal inheritance and so on. They don't look... Uh, they don't know anything about that or don't, don't consider that at all. They really have had quite a good life. And that is why we 
we uh, bemoan the fact when a, a, a person dies, especially they die uh, a little bit young, it has nothing to do with the gospel now. Uh, they die uh, on the battlefield or from a quick illness of some kind, and we say, oh, how sad. Why do we say that? Because now they're under the wrath of God? Well, if we were uh, following the Bible, we might say it for that reason. But, more, but mainly people say that and believe that because that person is deprived of something wonderful that's been going on in his life to pursue a career here and raise a family and so on and so on. So uh, that's, that uh, God did use people to glorify himself, to bring glory to himself, uh, but, but nevertheless... He it was, has been very merciful in the process of doing that. <coughs> and thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Captain. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead with your call. Yes. Yeah. The, the best thing anybody ever gave me was the Bible that they gave me in my whole life. Uh, can you turn to Matthew 24, 15, and 16? Matthew 24, verse 15. There, and 16. Uh, there we read. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, what is your question? I understand the parable, but is that, is that a command to all the churches, even the people who can't understand what parables mean? Yeah, see, the holy place, the only holy place throughout the church age is where the Bible is. In fact, that's true today. Where, well, no, it isn't true today because uh, of a, a major... Uh, thing that happened uh, to the church is when their time came to an end. But until the end, the church age came to an end, and God had a very, very uh, definite date for that to happen, the holy place is where the Bible was. And But here it's speaking about the abomination of desolation. And when we go through the Bible, that is a, a reference to Satan, not only in the book of Daniel, but we find that, for example, in Second Thessalonians 2, that the man of sin will take his seat in the temple. It's the same idea, that he now rules there. And then, let those who are in Judea, Judea being used as a picture of the kingdom of God, and throughout the church age, it is the churches that, that externally represent the kingdom of God, let them flee to the mountains. And when we search the Bible, we find that God frequently uses the idea of mountains to signify the Lord Jesus Christ. As he says in Psalm 121, to the hills or to the mountains, I will lift up mine eyes from whence cometh my help. Thank you for calling uh, uh, now, this command is given to them, uh, to the churches, uh, and if, if they don't understand it, well, that's, why, <laughs> that's why God has raised up a ministry like Family Radio, where we're able to explain it. In other words, uh, we c nobody can say, we don't, we don't understand this at all. Uh, we'll, there is help. That, uh, uh, so to, there is help. Uh, 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 on today's scene whereby they can begin to understand. But the fact is, first of all, they have to be intensely interested in wanting to know what that means. And that isn't happening today. Churches are not interested in the Bible. They're interested in promulgating and, and being faithful to their church doctrines or their confessions or uh, and what they have decided is important from the Bible, and they don't want to go any further than that. And that's, that's seen in the fact that churches have no interest in what family radio is teaching, yet everything we teach comes out of the Bible. And, uh, and how can that be? 
But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, good evening, Brother Campton. Yes. Uh, God bless. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to... Uh, I have a question, but first I'd just like to say that uh, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing and, and Family Radio, what they're doing. Um, I really believe in, in what you're preaching. And, um, you know, to all the other callers uh, that don't really agree with what you're doing, I would appreciate it if, uh, you know, they didn't call and, and try to argue with you, you know, because that's not very godly. You know, we should just uh, take it, you know, if people uh, don't uh, agree with what you say, then they don't have to call because, uh, you know, this is a positive radio station. No, excuse and, and you're me. Not, you're not looking for negativity, I don't believe. Yeah, well, excuse me. Now, you know, when Jesus was walking the streets of, uh, of uh, Israel when he was on earth, did he only talk to people who agreed with him, who were ready to say, oh, Rabbi, that's true? Or did he find again and again that the Pharisees would come trying to trap him? Uh, and uh, the same was true with the Apostle Paul as he came to the synagogues. Did they agree with him or did they, again, uh, debate with him and try to trap him? Uh, this is what we must expect. We're living in a world where we want to uh, be very open with the truth, but then we have to be ready to recognize that lots of people have opinions and they want to try to force their their uh, conclusions on you and so we must be ready to face this i'm glad that this is an open forum and that anybody can call for example we could have set it up where we would uh, have somebody uh, first interrogate the one who wants to get on and ask him now what do you want to talk about are you pro-family radio or anti-family radio? Well, you're anti. I don't think you should get on the air. Uh, uh, we're going to go, uh, I'm sorry, you cannot come on. Now, we could have done it that way, but no way. We don't pre, uh, pre-answer pre the calls at all, uh, except to make sure that they are uh, uh, well enough to be heard and uh, uh, and and we take the next caller and that's very very healthy and it's, it all of us can learn uh, to be assaulted we can learn to be patient to be more humble than ever before it's a good lesson for all of us but shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum yes good evening brother campaign hello yes go ahead with your call yes. Yes, uh, can you tell me when did the King James Version uh, was translated in English? When was it translated in the King James Version? The first edition came out in the year, uh, well, it was uh, just about exactly 400 years ago. At that time, the Bible was mainly, almost totally, in the Latin or the Roman language. It was uh, uh, it was under the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but then came the printing press about that time, and there came a great desire in various countries to have a Bible in their own language. And there was a king ruling in England at that time by the name of James. And he was somewhat of a theologian. He was quite interested in the Bible also. And so he deputized approximately 70 of the most uh, uh, scholarly people that could wor work on translation of the Bible and had them translated into the English language. And that is why uh, the King James Bible is called the King James only because he was ruler of England at the time that it was translated. No, it was not a perfect translation, uh, and some people, I had a fellow tell me today, uh, uh, or uh, t uh, tell me recently, you know, you worship the King James Bible. Absolutely not. <laughs> I examine every verse, 
uh, uh, in its original Greek or Hebrew to make sure that King James translators did the right job. And most of the time they did, but occasionally they did not. And and I, we don't go into a, uh, go into a, a tirade because of that. We just know that that. Uh, they're humans, and they had limitations also, and we're living in a day when God is revealing His Word a little more completely than when they did the translation. But it's amazing how well they did, uh, considering everything. And uh, so uh, it, 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 is, it turns out that it is unique in that it used, the translators used the, uh, the uh, copies of the uh, Greek language for the New Testament that were older than the Catholic Church. Uh, by around uh, the 3rd or 4th century, the uh, Roman or the Catholic version of the Bible had been made, and with whatever errors were put into it, that became the, the, uh, the most important translation. And they, uh, to avoid all of that, they went back to the copies that were earlier than any any uh, uh, Latin translation had been made, so that avoided one level of errors c- coming into the Bible. And so we're very, very grateful for that. And that's one of the reasons that the King James Bible has stood the test of time so well, more so really than any other translation of the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Harold. Yes. Uh, Two callers back, a caller called in, and he wanted to know why people called in. And they, according to him, their tactics... Uh, Excuse me. Excuse excuse me. Excuse me. Have you called in uh, 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 within the last 30 days... I, mean, I think that you have, and, and that we must not do. That's not fair to all the people who want to call in. So I'm sorry. We're going to go to our next caller. Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi, Brother Captain. Yes. I have a question. Uh, in Samuel, um, let me see. It's uh, uh, First Samuel... Um, I believe it's chapter uh, two. Let me see. Hold on, and I'll be right back with you right after this message. Okay. We have a caller on the line who wants us to look at a verse in First Samuel. Uh, what chapter is your 15, verse? Chap- cha- uh, yes, yeah, Samuel chapter First Samuel chapter fifteen verses ten and eleven, please. Verse ten and eleven. Uh, there we read, Then came the word of Jehovah unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto Jehovah all night. And what is your question? Well, um, here in mine it says, in verse 11 it says, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. Now, does, uh, uh, what, 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 what does he mean by regret? Does, 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 does God, does he have regrets? Well, you know, ultimately God does everything perfectly. He has a perfect plan that he works out. Right. But he's speaking to us who... Uh, who do have uh, regrets and who change our mind and so on. And so frequently he uses our kind of language oh. where he is really saying, you know, as, as you look at me, uh, I am repenting. I am really uh, changing my mind about Saul. Uh, we read this, for example, in, in, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 17 where... Uh, in a very interesting place where he says in uh, Jeremiah 17 he says uh, oh boy no I stuck my neck out and said I had a verse and I'm sure it's here but I haven't looked at it for a little while but anyway it's, it's a verse that really is saying that if 
if mankind, or, or it's, it's chapter 18, it's ver, chapter 18, where he says in verse 7, At what instance I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. It's, he's using our language. I will change my mind. Uh, and this is really what he's saying in First Samuel 15. Saul has turned out so bad, I really have ch- changed my mind about using him. Uh, but really, God knew the end from the beginning, and, and uh, he, he is relating his change, this change, or letting us know that it's because Saul has, has turned out so bad. But thank you. Thank thank you, and God bless. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I'm calling from New Jersey. Lucky me, I got through. I have three questions. Are you there, Brother Camping? I am. Go ahead with your question. My first question is concerning Genesis chapter 9, verse 21. Genesis chapter 9, verse... 21, verse 21, and he, and Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Is, so that, I, is that Genesis chapter 9, verse 21? Yes. Well... I don't know. I must have the wrong... Um... All right, let's go to your second question. Okay. Is the New King James Version as good as the first? Is the New King... Is the oh, new... Yeah, no, is, is, is... no, no, no. It is... Uh, <laughs> we'd like to think it is, but it is not. They also mm-hmm. made changes uh, that they should not have made changes. Really, uh, outside of the fact that the King James does have a few old English words that... We need a little help with, like concupiscence means uh, desire, uh, or we uh, prevent means uh, to go before or to be around. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it's got a few difficult words, but they're very sparse. They're not that common at all. And uh, uh, it just happens to be more faithful all the way through. Okay. Uh, I, I'm going back to that. Genesis, it must be, it's Genesis 8, verse 21, where the Lord says he will no longer, he will never smite the earth again. If he says that, why would there, why would there be an end on May 21st? It's Genesis 8, verse 21. Yes, well, we have to read more, you know. There, remember the biblical rule is you never draw, come to a conclusion until you have tested against Anything else that the Bible speaks that uh, about that might relate to your conclusion. Mm-hmm. Now here we read, and Jehovah smelled a sweet savor as as uh, uh, Noah was offering uh, sacrifices, and Jehovah said in his heart, "I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again." Smite any more every living thing as I have done. Now, how did he do it? By destroying the world with a flood. In Genesis 9, verse 20, uh, in Genesis, Genesis 9, verse 15, uh-huh. he says, And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. In other words, as I have done, he had destroyed all flesh by, by drowning them. He'll never do that again. He's going to destroy all flesh that have to be destroyed by burning them totally and annihilating them. Okay, one more question. Genesis chapter 6, verse who were the giants that were spoken of? Well, the gi- giants in the land, uh, I, I, I think what has happened is, and I, uh, I don't say this 
dogmatically. But they have, in our generation, mind you, just a few years ago, they have discovered uh, full-grown people. They were not pygmies uh, in, uh, in a cave in, in um, Indonesia, way up uh, on the mountainside, uh, way, way above any lake or, or water. And uh, they were buried there by water. And uh, they were only about a meter high, that is a little over th uh, th uh, maybe 39 inches tall. Mm -hmm. And they were full grown. And all the evidence seems to point to the fact that they were uh, some of the people who lived before the, found before the flood and were caught in that cave and were buried there uh, in, uh, with the waters uh, that c came upon the earth. And if if we've uh, if we've read that correctly, that is, if we if we uh, 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 if we're correct in in our understanding that they were uh, full grown individuals, and uh, and and scientists have really worked on that question, then we can say, well, what happened is that before the flood, mankind was much shorter than they are today. Uh, just well, like today, there are lots of full-grown people that are only four and a half feet tall, or there's some even four feet tall. That's not uncommon in some uh, in some uh, areas. And I'm not talking about pygmies now. Mm -hmm. That's a different situation. And uh, so all of us aren't five and a half, six feet tall as we uh, find uh, in uh, in uh, the countries that we live in, uh, but. But uh, it was God's plan that after the flood, mankind would grow taller, that they would be more like five or six feet tall. And, uh, but these, those who were living at that time as giants, that is, uh, uh, if they were five and a half feet uh, amongst a group of people, uh, all the other people being a, little, a few inches more than three feet, they would look like giants. They would look like giants. And, and, uh, but the focus really is not on the word giant. The focus is really on the fact that uh, they were, uh, they were um, uh, uh, the, the mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And, and that language appears to indicate that, they, uh, that some of these men were theologians. They were, uh, they were interested in religious things and yet they were teaching wrong things. Okay, so giants could mean they were they had some education, maybe more sure. education. Thank you very much. But thank you. I'm learning a lot from your program. God yeah. bless you. Thank you for calling and sharing. Okay. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping. Yes. Yeah. Uh, regarding your uh, teaching that uh, Christ died before the foundation of the world. Yes. Yeah, sure sounds all plausible, and uh, I've got a couple of verses. Maybe I was wondering, uh, go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right, all and right. the earth was without form. Now, one of your other verses is Psalm 2, verse 7, where this Day I have begotten thee. No, no, Psalm two verse seven. Yeah. Remember when Christ was introduced to us as the Son of God, He is still God. He is God. He never ceased to be God. Uh, when He was Christ, not the Son of God, because He had not risen from the dead, He was God then too. Uh, yeah. But now you're looking at. Psalm 2, verse 7, where we read, I will declare the decree Jehovah has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now we know that he could not have been begotten. That's a beginning. Having a beginning, he had to have died. That's why... We read in Acts chapter 13, for example, and another place, uh, that 
uh, let me turn to that a minute. We read there that it says, in, uh, God hath fulfilled, verse 33, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. He was raised up uh, so that he could be called the Son of God. And uh, this. Go uh, back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis. Yes. And we didn't have our first day until God said, Let there be light. Yeah. And that was the first day. Do you, do you think that this might be that same day? Might be a which day? The day that that he was begotten. No, no, it doesn't. It's not coincidental. Uh, the uh, Bible talks about he is a. Uh, uh, it, it was away from the creation. He finished the work totally. That's a. Hey, yes. That's one package, and then sometime later, or however, uh, time. How does time fit into eternity? I have no idea. But then he now is the creator. But thank you for calling and sharing. Creation came uh, away from from uh, the uh, he's the lamb slain uh, uh, from that is away from the uh, the foundation of the world. And it either had to be that it, that he was the lamb slain after creation, or sometime before creation. Uh, 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 and again, we have to be very uh, 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 modest about this because how does time fit into eternity? We don't really know. But you just using the language of the Bible, he was the lamb slain away from the foundation of the world. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. How are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Brother Camping, my question is uh, Romans 1, 20, 26 through 27. Romans 1, 26. Let's look at that. Romans 1, 26 to 27. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, uh, that is, of their sin, which was meat, that is, which was proper. Now, what is your question? And my next question is First uh, Timothy 1, 10. First Timothy one ten. First Timothy one ten. There we read for harmongers, that is those who are are adulterers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for per, 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 perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to found doctrine. Uh, it's talking here. Uh, we know that the law is good if it is you, you used lawfully, knowing that the law is not made for righteous men, but for the lawless and disobedient, and for these that we've been reading about in verse 10. In other words, the law uh, helps to demonstrate how sinful the heart of man is. Okay, now my question is on that, is that if today that we know that these are in the book of the Bible that is saying that this is not a good lifestyle to be living, what do we do when we do have friends or family members or people that we know that are living that lifestyle? We, pray, we... we pray for them that they might become saved. We don't have to go around pointing out people their sin. They, we, we have to prep. Because everybody's a sinner, so right. are you, and so am I. By nature, we're sinners. We don't have to point out sin. We have to uh, indicate to them that they, like 
all of us need a Savior because we're in trouble with God because of our sin. And whether it's a big sin or a little sin, whether it's a, a, a sin that everybody can see or a sin that we hide in our mind, it's still sin. We need a Savior. And we don't, we don't try to make a, an example of someone who is living in a, a very definite sinful way. Uh, on something like that, if that person does pass away, is that does God look at that as being not a like a detestable lifestyle that they lived, even though that they do love God, but they're still living that lifestyle? Well, no. If they died unsaved, if they if they became saved, they would not live that kind of a life. That's, oh. a, that's alien to a, a person who has received a brand new resurrected soul. Sin has become very, very, uh, uh, he's become very unhappy with sin. That's the one, he fears God. He, he wants to get as far away from sin as possible. And if he does fall into a sin momentarily, it distresses him very greatly. That's the nature of a true child of God. But uh, if they are continuing in sin, they're not saved. But uh, they've lived out their life and they have been uh, punished according to God's plan of judgment. Namely, they are dead, body and soul. There's nothing more that they know about insofar as suffering for their sin, although they still, their body will be shamed. That's uh, before God uh, during the day of judgment or their carcass or their... Uh, bones or whatever is left of them, at the, the ashes or the dust or whatever. All right. Well, thank you very much, Brother Camping, and uh, I really appreciate all the teachings that you've uh, given us, and God bless you. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Oh, thank you. I wasn't sure if it was going to be me or someone else. I'm worried about tears. Something you said the other night, you said, oh, so-and-so didn't do their homework because there's m more than one word for tears, you know, in different, the go different Gospels. Jesus cry uh, cried over Jerusalem, and then he cried when the uh, ladies were crying over Lazarus and all this different. And I just got mixed up. There are different verses in uh, Revelation 7, Revelation 21, and Isaiah 25, 8, where God promises to wipe away the tears of... Um, you know, when when you I don't when you get to heaven and all. I mean, I don't know. I'm just. I hope there's not a mix-up or something that I don't no, realize. No, or I no. hope I thought all those tears counted. Or no, uh, excuse me, I was simply uh, talking about words the way they were uh, translated. Now there are two Hebrew words or two Greek words that we were talking about. They're altogether different words, and both were translated. Jesus wept. One was in John 11 when Jesus was by the grave of uh, where uh, Lazarus, yeah. friend, Lazarus was buried. The other was uh, when he was looking at Jerusalem that was under his wrath and Jesus wept uh, at that time. Now, the fact is they are two different Greek words. How? They're not the same word. And we don't see that in our English translation. Okay, but and how? The, the reason that they're different, or the, the, they are both talking about weeping, but from a different vantage point. We can say, we can look at a person who is crying, we can say, she is crying. Or we can say, uh, she is, the tears are running down her cheek. Now we know that that means she's crying. But we've used different words, haven't we? Yeah, that's the, true. That's exactly what the Bible is doing. In so, both cases, there were tears. So God cares about all those tears. He'll wipe away your tears in heaven no matter what kind they were. Then, there you know. is, then there's no weeping in heaven of any kind because right. everything is perfect and yeah. joyful and wonderful. And what and wonderful? Yes. I'm sorry, perfect and what and wonderful? Absolutely. Per perfect and wonderful. And it is what is going to happen for the true believers is, is something so sublime and so marvelous that uh, we can't even begin to imagine 
how it all is. But there will be no taint of sin, no possibility of falling into sin, oh, yeah. no testing, nothing of that of this world. It'll be will be reigning with Christ forevermore in the most perfect and happy situation imaginable. But that's that's there are different words in Hebrew for tears too, aren't there? I'm just wondering. I don't know. Uh, in, in for oh, I don't know. In the Hebrew language? Oh, I don't know. I didn't check that out. Okay, just thank, wondered. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open yes, Forum. Yes, hello. Yes, money here. Oh, great. Uh, brother Kevin, I have a few questions, if I may. Yes. Uh, yes. Um. Well, I've been a Christian for a long time now, since I was about 17. And I've seen, like, you know, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Son of the living God, and He reigns. But and a lot of people in the world don't, you know... I mean, God is love, right? God is love. It's all God is, is love. Well, God no, is, no, excuse is, me. Uh, God is love. He certainly is a personification of love, but He is also... Uh, 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 he has a lot of other attributes that he, are make him all glorious. He is uh, he is merciful. He is uh, just. Uh, he has perfect justice. He is uh, uh, he is uh, a God of wrath. He's he's got. Uh, he, uh, the, the world can't contain all of the marvelous attributes of God. He is the Creator. He speaks and brings this marvelous universe into existence, and it's way, way beyond just God is love. Love, uh, love is one aspect of the glorious nature of Christ. So many people, like you know, the Bible says that you know in the last days that because of the true sins of many, love will wax cold, and it's because so many people are sinning. You know, the enemy just comes, in, the devil comes in and tempts man. And man sins, and because man sins, uh, you know, sin is to miss the mark of God. Well, Am I wrong? Well, well, actually, when God talks about love, uh, He defines love in the Bible. Uh, it's a different, different definition than you, than we would normally think about. But in John 14, we read in verse 21. This is from the mouth of God. Now, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Then he says, uh, just so that he, we want to make sure we understand this, verse 23, If a man love me, Jesus said, he will keep my words, and his words are the whole Bible, and uh, that my Father will love him. Uh, and then in verse 24, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. So, uh, when we really are going to talk about love, we are being, we should be also talking about obedience to the law of God. You know, a yeah. lot of people, they say, they'll say, Oh God, I love you. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. And they carry on. But they don't like keep the commandments. Say something to God. And yet they have no understanding that they're, that in their lifestyle they're breaking law after law of God, which indicates that they are not loving God at all. I mean, what about David? You know, I mean, David loved God so much, you know. He was a man after God's own heart, and he did nothing but sin. I mean, with Bathsheba and then, you know, that other stuff he did. Well, and no, he, he didn't do nothing but sin. He had a sin. Well, I'm not saying, you know, I knew he, he sinned a lot, but he still loved oh, God. Uh, excuse me, he... He was a man after God's own heart. He was a man who dearly loved the Lord. And we can't say that he just was going from one sin to another. That's well, not, not the nature. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying no matter what you Excuse do. Excuse me. Excuse me. That's not the nature of a true believer. Uh, it, it, we like to think, well, you know, well, I, I still have sin in my life, and I'm going on. I can't get... I still have to, from time to time, I commit this sin or that sin. But, you know, when we're a child of God, we still have a body that lusts after sin, so that can be expected. No, that's all wrong. That is not to be expected. When we become a child of God, 
we're given a brand new resurrected soul in which we never want to sin again. And therefore, our lifestyle will be way different than if it was before we became saved. A sin will be very appalling to us. We hate sin. We try not to sin at all. We, uh, we study the Bible to be, uh, try to be as faithful as possible to what we are to, how we are to live and think. And that is the nature of a child of God. But I've got a pause. And thank you for calling and sharing. One thing we might uh, think about in connection with sin and becoming a child of God, if we find ourselves alibying uh, for sin in our life or excusing sin in our life in any way, uh, in ev using any kind of an excuse uh, at all, then we have to ask a serious question, how can I really be a child of God then? Because sin is reprehensible in the life uh, to the individual who is a child of God. Uh, we, we don't want to sin. We have an intense desire, oh Lord, I just want to do your will. And if we fall into a sin, it's, 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 it's too bad. It, that's terrible. Uh, how can I do that? Oh, Lord, have mercy, have mercy. Strengthen me that I won't fall into that sin again. Work, work, may it be that thou wilt work, work in me to will and to do of thy good pleasure. Well, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Uh, thank you. Uh, could we talk about... Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. Revelation 16, verse 2. Let's look at that. 16, verse 2. There we read. Let me start with verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea, and so on. Now, what is your question? First of all, I mean, angels pouring out, you know, vials and uh, a mark of the beast, and not... Excuse me, not everybody has it. Could you explain that? No, the mark of the beast is, uh, is a figure of speech in indicating those who are owned by Satan. Like a, a rancher has cattle. And in order, they're all out on the open range, and in order to make sure that his cattle are his and not somebody else's, he puts his mark on that on that steer, he he puts a brand, he brands that or clips his, the ear, or puts something in the ear of that steer, something to indicate that he is the owner and not somebody else. And so the true believers, they have the name. This is all spiritual, of course. It's not literal. They have the name of their heavenly Father on their foreheads because they're owned by God. And the unsaved uh, who are uh, 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 who are living uh, 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 the, uh, the way Satan wants them to live, that is, they're not children of God at all, they have the mark of the beast. And that's why, and they are the ones that are subject to the plagues and the awful things that are talked about in chapter 16. These are, this is really another description of of uh, the day of judgment that during that 153 day period uh, there's going to be a, a, a very very uh, painful time there will be plagues there will be death everywhere and and there will be no 
grace, no mercy, no compassion, no nothing from God. It, it, it'll simply be the fact that mankind will be, uh, who have uh, refused to listen to God's final command uh, that, uh, that he is coming on May 21, 19, or 2011, and they refuse to listen when God is saying it very definitely from his word, and they've heard it and heard it, and uh, they don't want to obey, and so, okay, they're going to have to go through this final period. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall, and the angels pouring out the vials, that's just the, the messengers of God. Actually, it's God himself that is actually pouring out his wrath. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, good evening. Yes. Okay, uh, there's a place in the, in the Bible where it says that it is against nature for a man to wear long hair. And I remember one time you gave us uh, an explanation on that. I don't know if you could refresh my memory because after that I have another question. Well, that's found uh, about this business of long hair. is found in 1 Corinthians 11, I believe. And that has been mistranslated uh, uh, so that it was translated, doth not, in verse 14, doth not na even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. And that's a wrong translation. First of all, that translation doesn't agree either with truth because where in, the, where in nature does it true, I teach that long hair for a man is a shame to him? Where in the Bible does it teach any place that long hair is a shame to anyone? As a matter of fact, the Nazarene, those who took a Nazarene vow, their hair did grow long. And, uh, and uh, that was not a shame at all. It was a blessing. It really says a... Uh, 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 Oh my! I, I, I it, it, it's, it's. I, I, I can't quote it exactly the way it should be quoted, but it's, uh, it's, it's really saying that a man. Uh, it's not a shame for a man to have long hair. You're finding such a huge error in that passage. I mean, if you were to read that passage again, would you read read that passage in the Bible with that same error, even though you know it's an error? Would I do which? Would you would you read that passage? Like if you were to read that passage over the radio, would you read that passage with the same error, even though you find out you had found out it, it was an error? That no translation. Oh well, yes. I'll I'll, I'll uh, when I get a moment, I'll I'll uh, spell that out a little more easily, so it's a little more easily to re read, and I'll. I'll, maybe at the beginning of our next program, I'll talk about it. Because the reason why I'm asking, because you, you, there's a there's a family reading, there's a Bible reading on the, over the radio, uh, the, through family radio. And if you were to, would you correct that? If you, I mean, knowing that it's an error, would you correct it and have well, to read it? You know, I, I really can't do that. We have, we have. Uh, uh, from time to time, we do find an error and. And uh, we ju we just can't uh, <laughs> we we have so many obligations and duties that we're doing. If we had a, a multitudinous staff and and tons of money, maybe we could do that. But uh, maybe but we're not able to do that. I'm sorry. So is it is it okay? Is it is the way but to read thanks, it? Thank you for calling and sharing. And yeah. shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hi, my question is, I, I can't recall where I read it in the Bible, but when um, a woman cheats on her husband, that divorce isn't right in the Bible, but if a, man, if a woman cheats on her husband, then her husband has the right to leave her. So do you believe, or is it, is it true to believe maybe that I am not ever to marry again because of being unfaithful, and I believe that I... You know, I have lived with Christ in my life since then. Like, that sin has brought me closer to God. So I'm just, like, 
So if is a it, woman has been unfaithful to her husband and has been divorced, can she marry again? Is that your question? Yes. No, she may not marry as long as her husband is living, even though they are divorced. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, the wife is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And so even though she may have a, a, a technical divorce, uh, according to the law of the land she lives in, in God's eyes she is still married to her husband. She may not she may not marry somebody else as long as he is living. Now, if her husband dies, yes, then that marriage is all over, and she is able to marry again. Even if he is married himself, remarried. I'm sorry, even if... If he has remarried after he divorced no her and then remarried himself. It makes no himself. difference. Makes no difference. If, yes. we, if you've been divorced and your husband, husband is still living, you, if you're going to follow the Bible, you can not remarry if you want to be faithful to the Word of God. Okay, but thank, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Yes, Brother Captain, I'm involved in this church that has uh, that you have to do 11 studies, and then after you do the 11 studies, you get baptized by water, make Jesus Lord. And um, I want to know if uh, is that's the correct way of being a Christian. Well, now, first of all, why if you're in a church today, why are you disobeying God when God has told us uh, to come out of the church because Satan rules there? First of all, you're disobeying God. Secondly, you're serving Satan because right. Satan rules there. If you're, that is, if you're trusting the Bible, we know that to be true. So uh, anything else, any question about how your conduct in the church is moot, it doesn't, it's not important. The first question is, what are you doing there? It's right. the last place I would want to be. Okay. Now, I, got an, uh, I want you to, do, to, uh, to explain the scripture to me. And... John chapter 12, verse 44 to 50. John 12, verse 44. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that sent me, seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whoever, whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man, <coughs> man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Now, what is your question? I do leave that church, and if I believe in Jesus Christ, will I be safe? Well, uh, not just because you leave the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, or uh, you're saved if God saves you, and it's not going to. Be, you're not getting saved because. You believe in the Lord Jesus, that's a work that you do, just like going out of the church is a work. Those things can't get you saved, but outside of the church, God is saving a great multitude. And outside of the church, uh, uh, you can be pleading with God, Oh God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. Is it possible that I too might become a child of God? But you have to wait upon Him. He has okay. to do all the work of saving you. Right. I know there's so many churches out there. I mean, the world's full of churches and congregations and sectors. I just need to know because I, I want to be, 
I don't know if I, God will save me or not, but I do want to be saved, and I ordered some of your books. So uh, what, is the proper, what is the proper thing for me to do? Well, the first thing I would do is get out of the church and, and start reading the Bible myself and listening. Uh, you, uh, to, as you listen to Family Radio, you can be encouraged to look at this verse or that verse. But above all, I would be beseeching the Lord all the time. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. I know I don't deserve salvation. I know as a sinner that I should be come under the full wrath of God. But, oh, God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy on me. And uh, don't give up. I, uh, there is hope, tremendous hope, because God is not a respecter of persons, and you can... As you're praying, you can pray, and, oh, Lord, I know you are merciful, and I know I don't deserve your mercy, but, oh, Lord, is it possible I might, I might be, you might have mercy upon me and save me. But it's a time of great humility. We come with nothing in our hands. We bring us as the... As the song goes simply to the cross, we cling. In other words, we are coming to God uh, 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 with shame because of our sin. We're coming knowing we deserve the wrath of God, and yet we're crying to Him for mercy. Oh, Lord, can you be merciful to me, I, even though I don't deserve it? Right. One more question, Brother Captain. They, you know, like that church usually has Bible talk, then they have sector talk, then they have like uh, chemical chemical recovery ministries and all the kind of ministries. I mean, is that you know, legal in God's eyes? Anything connected with the church today is uh, is the property of Satan today, and you don't want anything to do with it. If you'd like to know more about this whole business. We have prepared a book, The End of the Church Age and After, and another book, Wheat and Tares, uh, uh, helping with the same, an understanding of the same subject. And don't hesitate uh, to call up or write for these. These are free of charge, and we'd be glad to send them to you. Thank you, Brother Camper. Thank, Thank you for information. calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Mr. Captain. I yeah, was yes. thinking, um, you know how you can use the calendar that we in America use? I, I'm sorry, your voice has faded away. Say that again. Do you know how we can use our American calendar with the 12 months and um, with the about 30 days in each month? And then we can draw a timeline using our calendar? We, uh, well, the, we, there is no calendar in operation today of uh, uh, 12 months of 30 days. That would only give you 360 days. I mean, approximately 30 days. I was thinking that, that just how we can use our calendar to have a tr timeline from history, then can't we also use the Hebrew calendar to do the same thing? Because what year is it in Hebrew? The, the calendars... That in looking at the history from start to finish, it's not based upon any calendar, either the uh, calendar in the Bible or a calendar that is in vogue in the, at the time that we happen to be living. It's based on a year from uh, one year to the next year is based on what God created in Genesis chapter 1. He created the sun uh, and uh, the moon and the stars and and planet Earth and the and the uh, uh, the sun and the moon and the planets and planet Earth uh, are actually a big celestial time clock in which uh, scientists have astronomers have very carefully measured the time from one year to the next. And it averages out at 365.2422 days. And that is the timeline that God works through in history. Every, every year, 
is exactly 365 days from 0.24 of almost a quarter of a day uh, uh, from one year to the next. And, and that always has to be the formula that we use when we're going through me, uh, the length of, of time from one, uh, one uh, thing to another. See, because I was, I was wondering now, you know how right now we're in the year 2009. Well, I was wondering if you knew what year it is in the Hebrew calendar. Well, that's uh, that, uh, that number, 365.2422, has been used again and again in working with the calendars of the Bible. Would you but know how many years thank, difference? Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our... Uh, uh, our next call, please. Welcome to Open Year, Open Forum. Yes, hello. Yes. Uh, I have two questions, and I'd like to take the answers over the air. Yes. Okay, my first question is this. What scriptures can you give me out of the Bible that I can read into that tells me that a true believer's soul goes to be with the Lord right after bodily death? Well, My second that, question uh, excuse would be me, this. Uh, excuse it, it, me. Let's talk about that a minute. All right. Remember, remember what Jesus told the thief on the cross who just became saved? He said, remember me uh, uh, when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, he certainly was not in paradise in his body. That was the thrown into the ditch or into a grave of some kind, but then it would be in his soul existence. Secondly, we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that when Christ comes again, uh, the, the uh, well, uh, let, me, let me turn to that and read that. There will be those who will be coming with him. We read in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, uh, for verse 14 uh, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so then also they them also which sleep in Jesus that is those who have died as Christians will God bring with him now he's not going to bring their bodies it has to be their soul existence that is brought what is your second question Okay, my second question is this. Uh, it's concerning the Sabbath. God tells us to keep the Sabbath day holy. And um, we're not supposed to do any work on that day, but people continue to work on that day. They cut their lawns and paint their fences. And what I want to know is what punishment will mankind suffer because of the disobedience? And to keep in mind that babies are born on the Sabbath day, People I, die on the Sabbath day. People yeah. get married on the Sabbath day. They drink and celebrate that marriage. And I want to know how does it all fit in with God's ruling. And I'll take well, that answer well, over the... The fact is that any kind of sin is contrary to the law of God, and we're subject to the wrath of God. But if we become a child of God and we commit a sin and don't recognize it as a sin, uh, even though even though it is a sin and would be under the wrath of God, the penalty for that sin has been taken by the Lord Jesus. He made a, uh, he made a payment for that sin. And so uh, the, the fact is that as children of God, as true believers, from time to time we may commit a sin, not even knowing that it is a sin, but that too has been covered by the blood of Christ. But thank you. And, and it, there are areas where it's very difficult to know how far we should go, like getting married on Sunday. Now, that's a fine day to get married, but what about we better be careful with the celebration if we're... Uh, I, uh, uh, are we going to be uh, 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 having or, uh, have a celebration that looks just like the celebration of the world? Well, that doesn't comport. That doesn't agree with being a child of God. But on the other hand, we could have a celebration in which we 
uh, sing song uh, hymns together and and read scripture and so on. There can be it can be a very very lovely kind of a celebration. But uh, uh, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Campin. Uh, could you read Luke twenty-two, fifty-two, and fifty-three, please? Luke twenty-two, verse. Which verses? Uh, fifty-two and fifty-three. All right, let's look at that. Twenty-two, verse fifty-two, and fifty-three. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him. But ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth my hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Now, what is your question? Well, um, it seems like the crime always fits the punishment. And he's talking to the chief priests and the elders. And he says, now, this is your hour. And they came at, at night as a thief to him. And I'm wondering, do you think that that would tie in, that he's always saying that he's going to come as a thief in the night to, like, the people in the churches? He's coming as a thief in the night. The Bible says that. He's coming because it's, it's like a thief in the night because he's coming to destroy them. He is coming... Uh, uh, to uh, to uh, bring judgment upon them, and they are uh, in spiritual darkness altogether. They have no uh, no knowledge of the light of the gospel. They think they're saved, but they're still in the in the uh, total uh, uh, gloom of sin and of spiritual darkness. Yeah, they they treated Jesus that way. They came at him at night like a thief and treated him that way so he didn't return. I'm wondering if that ties in. He's, he's gonna, you know, the crime fits the punishment. He's going to come right back at him the same way. Well, I, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. That is a, that is an interesting uh, connection, although, you know, we got to be careful. God can use a word in one place in the Bible in, in 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 giving a certain kind of instruction, and then he can use that very same word, and it might even be a fairly unusual word in another part of the Bible that and and use it in a way that it doesn't even relate to the other way. And so we uh, just because it's the same word, it doesn't necessarily mean at all that it ties the two passages together. But uh, uh, I have never reflected on this idea that you were presenting, so I'm not qualified to answer your question. Okay. Thank you, thank, Brother Campbell. Thank you for calling. And we've come to the end of our program. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.